the guardian of the threshold. Once you are capable of out-of-the-body observation, certain difficulties may enter into your feeling life. You find yourself forced into a quite different relationship with yourself than you had before. In ordinary experience, the world of the senses stands over against your soul in such a way that your soul regards the sensory world as outer and considers the experience of inwardness as its own property. But you cannot relate to the suprasensory outer world or environment as you relate to the sensible outer world. As soon as the soul perceives the suprasensory outer world, it flows together with it. The soul can no longer think of itself as separated from the suprasensory world in the way that we feel separate from the sensory world. In relation to the suprasensory environment, everything that the soul might call its own inner world takes on a certain character that at first is difficult to reconcile with the idea of inner life. You can no longer say to yourself, I think, or I feel, or I have my thoughts and I form them. <clears throat> Instead, you now have to say, something thinks in me, something allows feelings to light up in me, something forms my thoughts so that they arise in a quite specific manner to make their presence known in my consciousness. This feeling can have an extraordinarily crushing effect if your suprasensory experiences are of the kind that gives you the certainty that you are actually experiencing a reality and not giving yourself up to fantasy or illusion. You may, depending on how the experience occurs, see that the external suprasensory world wishes to feel and think for itself, but that it is hindered in what it wishes to bring about. At the same time, you may have the feeling that what wishes to enter your soul is the true reality and that it alone can illuminate that which you have experienced until now as reality. By the form that it assumes, the feeling tells you that this suprasensory reality completely eclipses everything that you previously valued in the reality you knew. This feeling is crushing because it makes you feel that you have to take the next step. What you have become through your inner experience requires that you take this step. Not to take it would feel self-destructive, as though you were denying who you are. At the same time, you feel that you cannot take the step, or if you did attempt to do so, it would remain incomplete. All this then changes into a new conception, namely that, as your soul is now, a task lies before it that it cannot accomplish. The supersensory environment will not accept it in its present state. It does not wish to have the soul in its present state within it. The soul, thereby, comes to feel itself somehow in contradiction with the supersensory world, saying to itself, quote, You are not ready to flow together with this world and yet only the suprasensory world can show you true reality and your relationship to it. Thus you have to cut yourself off from genuine observation of the truth." Unquote. This feeling will become increasingly decisive for the very worth of your soul. You feel that your life exists within an error, but a different kind of error than usual. Usually errors are errors of thought, but this error is lived. Errors of thought may be undone by replacing an incorrect thought with a correct one, but a false experience is part of the life of the soul itself. You, yourself, are the error. Therefore you cannot easily correct it. Think as you will, the error is there, part of reality, part of your own reality. There is something devastating to one's sense of self in this experience. You feel that everything in your inner life is painfully repelled by everything you long for. The pain you feel at this stage of the soul's journey goes far beyond any pain you can experience in the sensory world, dwarfing all that you have lived and grown through until now. 
This can have a numbing effect. You stand anxiously before the question, Where shall I find the strength to bear what is being laid upon me? Your soul must find the necessary forces within its own life in what we may call inner courage, inner fearlessness. To advance in the soul's journey, you will now need to reach the point where the forces necessary for you to bear your experiences open up within you. These will give you an inner courage and fearlessness that are different from what is necessary for life in the physical body. This kind of strength comes only from true self-knowledge. Indeed, at this stage of development, you will recognize how little you really knew about yourself before. You gave yourself over to your inner experiences without examining them as you would examine a part of the outer world. At the same time, through the steps that led you to be able to experience outside the body, you received a special method for self-knowledge. You learned to consider yourself from a standpoint that is possible only when you are outside the sensory body. The crushing feeling that follows on this becomes the beginning of true self-knowledge. Experiencing the erroneousness of your relationship to the outer world helps to reveal your soul's true being as it really is. It lies in the nature of the human soul that such insight into itself is painful. You have to have experienced that anguish for yourself before you can understand how strong the natural desire is to see yourself as having value and meaning just as you are. It may seem like a hard fact to bear, but it is the case. You must learn to face freely the ugliness of your own self. Previously you never experienced this ugliness because you never really penetrated your nature with your consciousness. Only in such moments do you notice how much you loved what you now perceive as ugly. The power of self-love thus reveals itself in its full magnitude. At the same time you recognize how little you are inclined to renounce self-love. The difficulties that your own soul's characteristics already provide in your ordinary life and relationships seem great enough. Through true self-knowledge, for example, you experience that while you thought your feelings towards someone were friendly, in the depths of your soul you were actually nursing a hidden jealousy or hatred. You know that such unexpressed feelings will come to light one day. You know, too, that it would be quite superficial to say to yourself, quote, now that I know that this is the case, all I have to do is eradicate my jealousy and hatred, unquote. But you will soon discover that such thoughts prove very weak when the urge to satisfy your hatred or express your jealousy breaks from your soul with all the power of a natural force. Such moments of self-recognition come to each of us according to the constitution of our individual soul. They occur in conjunction with experiences beyond the body, because then one has true insight into oneself and is no longer confused by the desire to see oneself in the particular way one wants to be seen. <clears throat> Such insights into oneself are painful and crushing, but those who wish to gain the capacity to experience outside the body cannot avoid them. They have to happen, because those who walk this path must assume a special relationship with their own souls. Such self-understanding of universal human nature requires the greatest strength of soul. Observe yourself from a standpoint that until now has been outside your soul life. Say to yourself, quote, I have viewed and judged the things and processes of the world according to my human nature. I am now trying to imagine that I no longer see or judge things that way. But if I were to no longer see or judge things as I always have, I would certainly not be who I am. I would have no inner experiences. In fact, I would be nothing." Unquote. It is not just people who think only about the world and the everyday affairs of life who would have to admit that they are nothing. Scientists and philosophers would have to admit the same. After all, philosophy too 
considers and judges the world only according to the characteristics of the human soul. But such a way of judging cannot merge with the suprasensory outer world. It will be rejected by it. This is why all that one was previously is rejected. Let me read that again. This is why all that one was previously is rejected. To enter the suprasensory world you must look back at your whole soul, your capital I, as something to be cast aside. Until you enter the suprasensory world, however, you cannot avoid taking this I to be your true nature. Your soul must see the true human essence in this I. You say to yourself, through this I of mine I must make ideas about the world. If I lose this I, I shall lose myself as a being. Your soul's strongest desire is always to guard the eye, for it does not wish to lose the ground from under its feet. But as soon as you enter the suprasensory outer world, your soul will no longer feel that it, what it feels in ordinary life. Your soul must step across a threshold, leaving behind not just this or that treasured possession, but its very own being. It must be able to say that it now sees that what it once valued as its most powerful truth may on the other side of the threshold of the supersensory world appear as the greatest error. Faced with such a demand, a soul may shrink back. It may in fact feel powerfully that what it has to do is an abdication, a revelation of the nothingness of its own being. When approaching the threshold and being presented with the need for self-renunciation, the soul may feel more or less helpless. This experience can take many forms. The approach to the threshold can happen quite instinctively, and to people who think and act through their senses, the experience may appear very differently from what it really is. For example, it may feel like a deep aversion toward all suprasensory truth. In such a case, people might, for instance, consider their experience to be just dreams or fantasies, simply because, unknown to them, they harbor in the depths of their souls a fear of those truths. Such people may feel they can live only with what the senses and reason reveal. They therefore avoid approaching the threshold of the supersensory world. They may cover up that avoidance by saying, for instance, that rational thinking and science cannot support the truth of what is beyond that threshold. The truth, however, is that such people love rational thinking and science as they know them, because this rational thinking and science are so strongly connected to their eye. This is a very common form of self-love, something that we cannot take into the supersensory world. A different situation may arise when someone does not stop instinctively at the threshold. He or she might approach the threshold quite consciously and then turn back, fearful of what lies ahead. Such a person will not easily efface the effects that approaching the threshold has upon normal soul life. These effects will lead to a feeling of powerlessness that then spreads throughout the entirety of the soul. The proper approach is for people to prepare in such a way that upon entering the suprasensory world they can set aside what in ordinary life they feel most strongly to be the truth and thus be able to perceive and judge things differently. But one must also understand that in resuming one's customary relationship to the sensory world one has to use the feelings and way of reasoning that are valid for that world. One must learn not only to live in two worlds, but also to live in them in two quite different ways. A person must not allow his or her healthy power of judgment in the world of sense and reason to be adversely affected just because a very different way of judging must be used in the other world. Such flexibility challenges human nature. It is achieved only through continual, energetic, and patient strengthening of the soul. Those who have experienced the threshold feel that it is a blessing for the normal human soul not to reach that threshold. The feelings that arise in them are such 
that they cannot but attribute the fact that most people do not approach the threshold to a benevolent power, a being who shields us from experiencing the danger and terror of self-annihilation on the threshold. Behind the outer world, given to us in daily life, lies another world. A powerful guardian stands at the threshold to ensure that people experience nothing of the laws of the supersensory world. For doubt and uncertainty about that world are more easily borne than the sight of what we must leave behind if we wish to enter it. Until we ourselves approach the threshold, however, we are protected from those experiences. Even though we may hear accounts of them from those who have approached or stepped over the threshold, we remain protected. In fact, such accounts can serve us well when we do approach the threshold. In this case, as in many others, it is better to undertake something when you already have an idea of what awaits you than to approach it without that knowledge. But what a traveler in the supersensory world can gain in self-knowledge remains unchanged by such prior knowledge. Therefore the assertion by clairvoyance, or those intimate with clairvoyance, that we should not speak of such things to those who have not resolved to enter the supersensory world is not true. We now live in a time when we must become increasingly familiar with the nature of the supersensory world if our soul lives are to be adequate to meet life's demands. The spreading of supersensory insights, along with knowledge of the guardian of the threshold, is one of the tasks humanity must undertake now and in the future.